Good evening, everyone. So I'm Christian Anderson. I'm the executive director of Louisville Visual Art. Uh, as I have been saying, I appreciate you all being here. This is the second of our artist resource series. I want to thank uh, Glenn Barber for presenting today. Glenn has been LVA's CFO for quite some time and um, has a real passion for helping artists, uh, which is one of the reasons that he has been taking his training and, and assisting me and assisting LVA. Um, I wanna thank Brooke Smith um, for underwriting our artist resource series for the next year. Um, I'm also excited to announce that next month, we're still trying to nail down the official day. So that's one of the reasons why I'm not telling you it, but is going to Esther Callahan, who is the Great Meadows critic in residence and visiting us from Minneapolis is going to be doing an artist resource series session entirely on how to conduct a successful studio visit with whether it's a curator or a critic or a gallerist. So that's going to be October's offering. And we're probably looking at the uh, third week of October when the leaves are just perfect. Uh, I obviously want to thank uh, Keith uh, for all that he does for LVA and for organizing all of this. And without any further ado, I would like to hand it off to my friend and colleague, uh, Glenn Barber, uh, to talk to everyone about how uh, they can best uh, think about taxes as an artist. So thank you so much, Glenn, and, and take it away. Thanks, Christian. Excited to uh, provide uh, help with the Artist Resource Series. And uh, a little bit about myself. I am the uh, CFO, Finance Director for Louisville Visual Art. I have been for a couple of years now. It is a part-time position. Uh, the rest of my time, I'm a, uh, I am a certified public accountant and I spend the rest of my time uh, in that role, working with clients and uh, preparing tax returns and so forth. Um, today's uh, topic, uh, as I understand, we have webinar attendees who are uh, geographically different uh, from the Louisville metro area. I understand we have some folks uh, from multiple states. Most of what I described today will be IRS related. Most states tax based on the IRS form that's submitted. And so, uh, so even though I may be discussing some Kentucky or even some Louisville issues, uh, those will apply. Second thing I'd like to mention is I know that the audience uh, in this webinar is it composed of some people who are not yet in the business of being in a creative. Uh, they, are, they are creative, but they're, they haven't turned it into a business yet or a livelihood yet. Uh, and then we also have attendees who are already doing it and part of it. And so my challenge is how do I, uh, how do I address both of your needs uh, without um, boring or talking over uh, one of you. So there will be times when it will be less productive for you, but uh, hang with me, especially those of you who are already in business, you already file tax returns related to your creative activity. Uh, when we get toward the end of the presentation, there's a lot of meat on the bone for you there. Uh, second thing I want to mention is that uh, I'm not going to be discussing bookkeeping. This is not about accounting. It's not about bookkeeping. Uh, but I am excited and, and, uh, and Christian and the group have uh, decided it's a good idea. In the future, I will present that, uh, hopefully in a manner where we can talk about QuickBooks Online and what kind of uh, ways you can simplistically and cost effectively uh, keep up with your books and records. But that's not for today. Um, what I want to focus on... <clears throat> Right now, and my slide is not moving forward, pardon me. Try the space bar, Glenn, or the arrow key. That work? No, it is not. I'm terribly sorry. We should have, we checked, we checked everything else. Well, okay, here we go. Let's see if we can. Here we go. Thank you. Okay, very good. We just uh, so, we're gonna, uh, so for uh, for the IR, I'm going to focus mostly on the IRS during this presentation. Uh, I want to remind everybody that we have a self-reporting tax um, um, uh, mechanism in this country, and uh, in generally speaking, 
it, once you file, the IRS has three years to come back and audit you and decide whether or not uh, you filed correctly. Um, if there are, everything I say is gonna have an exception. We don't have enough time to delve into those. So I'm gonna speak in a lot of uh, generality that, that deals with that. Uh, I, I think the best way to approach this is to, is to begin with the end in mind. And the end in mind is, oh my gosh, what happens if the IRS sends me a letter? And of course, that's a blood pressure moment when you receive that in the mail. And incidentally, it will always be in the mail. It will never be a phone call and it will never be uh, an email, certainly not in an initial meeting. Uh, so I wanna talk about the various audit programs that there are. Um, the first one is real easy. It's the automated under reporter. This is totally computer generated. What happens is there's one place in the country, it's in West Virginia, uh, where they have the computer program. Anybody who uh, sends information to the IRS related to your social security number or your employer identification number, what we often call a taxpayer ID number, companies who send that information to the IRS is accumulated. And then they're looking, when you file your return, they're simply comparing uh, the, the uh, brokerage statement that you got, the interest statement that you got from the bank, the 1099 you got for that contract labor gig that you did. Uh, all of those things come in. And, and, is, and if the math works and there's no issues, you never hear from them and you don't know that it occurred. But when, when there's a shortfall, then you get an, a computer generated letter uh, with a bill because they're able to do the calculation and, and the bill comes and they say, pay this amount. So how can this happen? Well, uh, if sometimes people who report 1099 information to the IRS will not send you a copy that doesn't get mailed or whatever. So there's lots of reasons why that can occur. The second audit program is, is what's called a correspondence examination. This is simply, you get a letter, there's some item, usually it's a single item on your tax return. They're not making a demand for money, they just want more information. And, the, and I'll explain why that comes about in just a moment. Uh, these are going up in terms of the pain scale. <laughs> uh, second, the third item is the office examination. Uh, this is, you have to think pre-COVID, uh, this is actually where they ask you to come to the nearest IRS office where you're located and to bring records associated with whatever item is they want to discuss. And it might be more than one item, it might be your entire Schedule C, something like that. Generally, if it's, con if it's a complex tax return or a lot of revenue or deductions, you're not gonna get an office examination. Uh, then it will move to what's called a field examination. That's where they want to come out to you where you're located, where you produce your revenue and, and, and take your deductions and, and sit down and have, uh, see what you're doing and have access to your records. And, 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 and they will tell you then exactly what they are there uh, to, uh, to see. The, the final one, nobody ever wants this. There are not a lot, but is a full research examination. The point of this uh, audit program with the IRS is they wanna learn taxpayer behavior. And they go over every item on your tax return, every piece of paper, source document, whether you have them, you don't have them. And the reason for that is because they're trying to gain information on what's really happening out there so they can somehow um, address that and make adjustments for the rest of the taxpayers. Uh, and they do that through this thing called the discriminant inventory function, uh, a diff, and you get a diff score. Every taxpayer who files a return will get a diff score. This is proprietary information, the IRS, they don't tell us how they do it, but it, 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 and, it's, and it's done by a computer. And then the information is provided to the service centers where you know, there are multiple service centers in the country, depending on where you are geographically. And then those get, uh, the, the death score gets sent to the service center for them to now put eyeballs on your return. 
And this is a good point for me to mention uh, something that is important. You should always e-file, electronic file, your tax return. Uh, you should not send a paper tax return to the IRS. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but this is one of those. Uh, you don't want eyeballs on your tax return uh, unless, you know, and you don't want to invite that. And there's also less chance that there's going to be an input error uh, on their end, causing your diff score to get all out of whack and causing them to uh, take a look at your return. Uh, so let's just say, and we'll talk in a minute about some of the items that cause your diff score to get uh, uh, high blood pressure going, but, uh, but let's talk about what happens in the process. So, so eyeballs get on your return, whether it's a transcript from an e-file or whether it's an actual, your paper return, a copy of it that they're looking at, uh, you're gonna get a notice of an examination that comes in the US mail. They're gonna explain to you exactly what is involved in the, in the examination. More than likely, they'll tell you what the scope is. Uh, there will be assigned a revenue agent. This is an individual person uh, and you will communicate with this person uh, whether you'll get a telephone number and all that going forward, and, and you will be asked to provide the information and substantiate the deductions that you've claimed, and, uh, and then they may think there's income that you failed to include, and you may have to deal with that as well. The majority of the time, though, it is dealing with uh, deductions that you've taken. The IRS revenue agent will then make a determination on whether they think you have substantiated your deductions. If they think you have, you've done a good job, uh, they, they, they think the tax return is fine, uh, then they close the case with no adjustment necessary and everybody goes on with life. That's a good day. Uh, if instead they determine that you uh, failed to substantiate uh, deductions and you owe tax money, and in addition to that, now you owe penalties because this is always at some time in the future, um, then they're gonna present you uh, with, with what their findings are, a determination uh, letter. And then you're, you have two choices at this point. You're either going to accept it, uh, which, which means you, you accept it, you agree to pay the tax that they say and the penalties. If you don't have the money, they'll have a payment plan worked out for you. Uh, and if, uh, or you can appeal. The appeal is within the IRS. Uh, so you're, you're going up the ladder, basically you're uh, going to the revenue agent's manager. Uh, and, and, but there's a risk here. Uh, let's say you have a, a new red revenue agent who does not, uh, who misses something and the manager who's been experienced catches something. Uh, guess what? They've decided now you really owe more tax because you didn't accept the first one, so you've left yourself open. Uh, so, uh, or they may come back and say, yeah, okay, we agree that maybe you did do a better job of substantiating than the revenue agent thought on this piece, but the other piece, uh, we still contend that you did not and you owe tax. At that point, you'll have a second, uh, you know, final determination presented to you. You'll either accept it, uh, or if you don't accept it, uh, you will wait for them to send you what's called a notice uh, of deficiency, an NOD, and, and, then, and then your option then is to go to tax court. Uh, take a quick minute to talk about tax court. Um, and by the way, you can also go to federal court, but most people go to tax court, so we're going to focus on that. Congress created the special court system to deal specifically with IRS matters. Uh, there's no jury. It's only there are judges. They travel. Uh, so every then and and they're uh, so every other year or so they're in Louisville, and it just depends on uh, on where you catch. Uh, but they they go to all the major cities, and then secondary cities like Louisville, they they try to come about every other year. Uh, there are two tiers to tax court. The the small uh, the smallest tier, the lowest level, deals with uh, deficiencies of $50,000 or less. Deficiency meaning the IRS says you owe them $50,000 or less. Uh, in that case, 
it, it goes to what's called small case tax court. And that's, it's very informal. It's not like you see on these law shows on TV uh, where, you know, somebody objects and somebody says it's hearsay. It's not any of that. Uh, it's just, you tell your story to the judge. There is an IRS attorney uh, across the table. They're uh, telling the judge, judge is trying to find findings of fact, trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, and then we'll come back uh, subsequent to the to your meeting and render a decision, uh, which is which is final. Um, that's for fifty thousand and less, which quite frankly we're probably more uh, more going to be involved with. Uh, there is at the higher level, uh, they do get formal. The federal rules of evidence are required, and that's where the hearsay and the objections and the you know the references to former tax cases and all that are done. Uh, if you're in that realm, you, you need to have a, uh, a tax attorney, somebody representing you in tax court. Uh, you can represent yourself in the small case. Uh, and our, a CPA and an enrolled agent are, uh, can, can represent you during the entire process, but cannot represent you in tax court. Uh, There's some exceptions to that, but again, they're, they're narrow, so we will not focus on them. Uh, so I, I want to talk about, uh, just again, real quickly, uh, how the IRS looks at things. Um, I want you to just take a little bit of a closer look at, at this slide. Um, and just I want you to focus on it just a little bit because the, the IRS sees the world this way. Okay, so the IRS, theirs, everything that you create income-wise, they view as theirs. And this is important when we talk about gross receipts. You, there, you don't even have to ask yourself, I wonder if this is taxable. The answer is yes. If you pick up $20 on the sidewalk, the IRS says that's taxable. You should put that $20 on your tax return and, and pay tax on it. If you buy a, a sofa, used sofa at, at a garage sale, and there's three thousand dollars stuffed inside a cushion, you you have to pay tax. So uh, now you don't have to pay tax if somebody is gifting you money, but that's really uh, about the only item. So I'm gonna I'm gonna focus now for those of you who are thinking about getting in business, uh, turning your creative pursuits into money making livelihood business, you're not there now. So those of you who are already there now, bear with me for maybe the next 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, so this is, well, who's gonna tax you if you decide to go into business? Well, the IRS, of course, that's the federal level. Uh, in Kentucky, we have the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Louisville has its own tax uh, called an OL3, which is uh, pretty tough. Uh, small cities here uh, have uh, small taxes, but you have to file and you have to pay. St. Matthews, Jefferson, uh, Jefferson Town, um, uh, Linden, uh, various other places. Uh, in this geographic area, again, we have Indiana. Indiana's counties tax you uh, on income, but the good news is you get to put those in an Indiana state return. So what kind of tax taxes will you have to pay? Again, this is for the people who are new. Uh, to the equation, you're going to have income tax, and that's going to be based on your net profits uh, or your taxable income. Uh, sales tax, if you create art, tangible product, uh, whether it is ceramics or painting or whatever, you're, you have a sales tax issue. You're going to have to uh, register with the states generally uh, and, and get a retailer number and collect sales tax from your customer and remit it to the state and you're gonna to have to file a state sales tax return. Uh, they also want property and in, in inventory tax. Uh, we think of that property tax as our home or, or maybe our vehicle, but it's also if, if you have, if you set up an artist studio and you have uh, paint and you have brushes and you have an easel and you have an, uh, an, an Apple computer, uh, those are all property and, and and the states want you to file a property tax return on that. Now, realistically, does that happen if you're that small? No, you don't. But, um, but I'm just saying, you know, the rules say you should. 
Uh, there's these other taxes, entity, gross receipts, occupational tax that the little cities um, collect in the interest of time. I'm gonna gloss over those. I do wanna talk about self-employment tax, but I'll do that in a moment uh, to talk specifically of what that is. Uh, penalties and interest, don't forget, if you don't file the way they say you should and or you don't pay on time or the way they say you should, uh, they do like to collect uh, penalties uh, and interest. So again, for those of you new to the equation, the basic formula for taxation is gross receipts minus deductions equal your taxable income. Uh, and But the reason I put this up is a lot of people think if they get payments through Venmo or PayPal or whatever, if it's for the creative product that you're producing, uh, then it's, it's a gross receipt. And so you, you have to record that on your tax return. Uh, and then, uh, and, and, and you have a taxable event on that. Uh, deductions, the second part of the equation to arrive at taxable income, Deductions must be ordinary, necessary, and reasonable. Those are, you'll hear those terms all the time within uh, the IRS. And ordinary, uh, necessary, and reasonable are highly subjective. And that's where you get into an argument. I sometimes tell clients on the gross receipts side, if you fail to report income, uh, that's potentially jail. If you get aggressive on your deductions, that's just a big argument. Uh, and now you might lose it, but uh, it's a different scenario. Uh, so you'll, if you first enter in and you don't want to incorporate or create an entity, uh, you're going to be what's called a sole proprietor. Sole proprietors are simply a person engaged in the business, and you're going to file a special schedule within your own individual 1040 tax return uh, that's Schedule C. So for instance, those of you who who are accustomed to doing TurboTax and other uh, software like that, uh, you, you, know, you, you'll, you can still do that using the Schedule C form within your tax, uh, tax software. So here we got some common business deductions. Um, there are many that are not on this list. Uh, I will point out that uh, one of the nice things is if you're self-employed, there are some fantastic retirement plans that are available to you that are not available to you if you're a W-2 wage earner. Um, I'm not going to get into those right now, but if you're in an existing, um, uh, we are creative businesses existing and going on and you're making money, you ought to look at what retirement options are available to you um, to help save on your tax bill. The next slide I'm going to show you are, are the things that get, remember I talked about the diff score, uh, and that is, uh, these are the diff winners. So uh, I call them the diff delights. Uh, Non-cash charitable contributions. Now, incidentally, you don't do charitable contributions on a business return. If you're Schedule C, that goes on your itemized deductions. If you're an entity, it still flows through, but it flows through to your itemized deductions. But I want to give an example. You're an artist. You've created a piece of art. You have it for sale for $1,000. Uh, it is not sold. It, you know, you have it. Uh, a, uh, the Cancer Society calls you and says, hey, do you have something for our silent auction, you say, sure, happy to. You put your painting in there and guess what? You do not get a $1,000 non, uh, non-cash charitable contribution deduction on your return. You don't get a deduction for $1,000. You get a deduction for the, uh, for the, uh, the, the amount of paint that went on it and you get a deduction maybe for brushes if they were consumed in the production of it, and you get a deduction for the cost of the canvas. So realistically, you know, we're not talking about a lot relative to the price tag that you've placed on it. And that is regardless of whether they get $10,000 at auction for it or whether they don't even sell it. You know, you just, you, you cannot determine what the deduction is it's only what you've paid out to get it. 
Um, okay, so now we're gonna get into the kinds of deductions that are on your tax return when you're in business that get the diff uh, score and, and the eyeballs uh, subsequent really excited. Travel expenses, this is a big one. We're gonna talk about a tax case here shortly. Uh, travel expenses contributed to that. Um, and, uh, and so they, they're gonna scrutinize those. Automobile and mileage, uh, whether you uh, take direct automobile expenses or take a mileage deduction, you get to choose between the two. Um, but I will tell you that uh, that's another area that, uh, that they scrutinize quite a bit. Entertainment, of course. Uh, and then uh, really one of the really big ones, big one is business use of your home. And, and so uh, uh, I will share with you, if you're in Louisville, Kentucky, where ho home housing prices are not uh, tremendous compared to the rest of the country, um, and especially if you have a small space within your home, I would, I would just not recommend you taking this deduction, even if you're entitled to it, it because it just brings more scrutiny to your return. Now, by contrast of that, uh, I have a client in San Francisco and I have a client in, in Boston. Uh, I file returns for clients in about 15 states. Uh, those clients have small footprint um, housing because that's what you get in, when you're in the cities and those places. Uh, and they're also very expensive, which means we get to take a great amount of depreciation. And so I do recommend to those two clients because the savings are significant and they do qualify, so they should take advantage. But I tell them you're at a higher risk for audit. Um, I did wanna point out, uh, I just this is what Schedule C looks like. Those of you who file this already know what it looks like. I'm not gonna go over this form. It is in the deck here. Uh, if you're new to figuring out if you wanna be in business, you can see it's not a big, complicated, terrible form. This is page two. Those are the only two pages you have. This page deals with uh, where you put your vehicle expenses and information, and you have other expenses that were not listed on the front. I do want to mention if you start business, you're in Louisville, uh, you owe a Louisville Metro OL3 occupational tax. It's 2.2% on your net profits. One thing we find out is a lot of people who are in business to begin with don't know about this. So you need to know about this. And the reason why is remember I talked about the sharing of information uh, of, of the computer system with the IRS. Well, they also share that information with uh, other taxing authorities. They, they, they send information back and forth. So if you're in Louisville, you get a 1099 from somebody for some work that you did or goods that you know you sold or whatever, uh, and it goes to the IRS, it eventually will find its way to Louisville. Louisville will send you a letter and say, hey, you know, the IRS reported that you received 1099, you owe us tax. And they're gonna expect you to pay that tax. Um, again, I'm not gonna go over this form. This is what the occupational license tax return looks like. This is the first page that allocates the tax, you actually start on the second page, uh, which you have three columns, individual uh, here, you have partnership here and corporation. So depending on who you are, you put information in and you file the return. Okay, so now I've, I've talked about when you're a wage earner, you're used to, again, we're talking about those thinking about becoming in business as a creative. Uh, when you're a wage earner, you're used to your employer withholding tax and sending it to the IRS. When you're self-employed, you're in it for yourself, you, you don't have that. So you have to make estimated payments. You'll often hear this referred to as quarterly estimated payments. They're not exactly on a quarterly schedule, but close enough. Uh, the first one for a given tax year is April 15th. Then you have June and September. Those are the most common ones where people mostly make their estimated payments. Uh, and then you have again, uh, one more opportunity at the end of the year by January 15th. If you don't pay along the way by making these estimated payments, the IRS gives you a penalty if you wait until April 15th to pay the big tax bill. Uh, so you will get a penalty for that, even if you file on time 
and you pay on time, you didn't have withheld enough along the way, so they'll give you a penalty. It's not as bad as some other penalties, but it is a penalty. Uh, filing due dates are, uh, if you're a, a corporation, an S corporation or a partnership, you're supposed to file by March 15th. That's because you're a flow through entity and they want you to get in the hands of individual taxpayers that information so they can file on April 15th, which is also the date that corporations need to file. So let's talk about self-employment tax. This is the tax that you pay when you are in business for yourself unless you are incorporated. And it's true whether you're a partnership, meaning you're in business with somebody else, uh, and or whether you're a sole proprietor filing Schedule C. And the gist of it is you are now both the employer and the employee. And so while you are used to paying seven 0.65% of your pay in FICA tax, which is what it's called on your W-2 wages, uh, which covers Social Security and Medicare. Uh, it funds those items. Uh, now you, you didn't, you may not have known, but your employer pays the same amount on your behalf. Uh, and now they get a deduction for that, but they have to pay it. So, uh, and so now you get to pay both. So congratulations. You get to pay 15.3% even before you pay income tax. We're gonna, when we get to the slide that deals with entity choice, this is the reason, and really my perspective, the only reason you decide to become uh, taxed as an entity rather than taxed as a Schedule C sole proprietor. Uh, I wanna get into the hobby loss rules quickly. The tax case that we're gonna go over uh, deal specifically with this. I know those of you who are already uh, creative in business, filing a business tax returns, whether it's Schedule C or an entity level return, you're saying to yourself, hey, I already know this and I'm not a hobby. Guess what? Uh, if you've had profits all along, but this year you have a big loss, you have to worry that the IRS is gonna say, hey, uh, this given year, I'm sorry, but it's a hobby this year. Uh, and, and so their rules are simple. If you have hobby profits, they get tax. If you have hobby losses, you don't get a benefit. Um, classic heads they win, tails you lose. So let's go over an example here. Uh, you know, I'm an accountant. I had to throw in a, a spreadsheet uh, with some numbers uh, during the presentation. So, uh, so here's, a, here's a W-2 wage earner somebody is working uh, for an employer, $45,000 in annual salary. We're gonna keep this simple, ignore all other aspects of the filing, except that they do take the standard deduction. Uh, and at the same time, they, they have decided on January 1st, they're opening an art studio. Uh, they're gonna file on Schedule C as a sole proprietor. Uh, they are, they have, uh, they're renting a studio for $500 a month. That's where we get the $6,000 in rent for the year. They have a cell phone that's $100 a month that they're claiming is related to their uh, art sales. Though so that's $1,200 for the year. Uh, the supplies are the things we mentioned earlier, the canvas, the smocks, the, the brushes, the paints, uh, all of those things. Uh, they're claiming that they have a vehicle uh, where they're claiming mileage, where they went to purchase those items from some place like Preston Art Center. I'll give them a shout out. Uh, they, are, they work with us a lot and they give us fantastic service. So there's a shout out. Um, and, uh, or maybe the vehicle mileage comes from delivering the art. But in this example, we have gross receipts of $500, which is the top up here. Then we have all these expenses that add up to this amount so now we have a net loss. So here's how the IRS is gonna look at this. If this is a business, they're gonna let you take your wages minus your loss and come up with a taxable income that is less. Now this also has the uh, standard deduction. So if they let you take the loss, you have a lower taxable income and a lower tax bill. 
if they say, I'm sorry, this is a hobby, even if you've been reporting and they've been accepting that you were a business um, and because you had profits, now you have a loss, they come in and say it's a hobby, uh, then they're gonna say, you don't get to deduct it. You only get the standard deduction, which is brings it to this amount. And now your tax bill is $3,695. So you can see it's a, it's a big number here. And if we add a zero to any of this or we ramp it up three or four times, uh, we're talking about important, serious money. And by the way, if they're claiming this and then they come back and it, you said this, you said uh, that it's this and they come back and say it's this, it's not just the difference, they're gonna get penalties on top of that. So you're gonna add another 40 or 50% uh, to that amount is what you're gonna have an argument over. Uh, so I wanna quickly uh, talk about what are, what are the things they look at to determine whether you're a hobby or not. Did you, were you business-like in your manner and how you did it? Uh, complete books, did you put a lot of time and effort? Was this your livelihood? Uh, did the loss happen beyond your control? You know, if you have COVID, you can't have customers, it's beyond your control. This year you have a lot of losses. You know, if you, you should be able to take those. Uh, did you have methods changed to improve your profitability? If you're not selling art, maybe you don't need an art studio at $500 a month. Did you reduce your expenses to try and achieve profitability? Uh, other, are you knowledgeable? I'm not an artist. If I want to start an art uh, business, um, they're going to look at me and say, I'm sorry, no. And any of those who saw the rainbow on the free wall that I just did during Good for Good, uh, can confirm that. Uh, likewise, you're not probably going to be good at being in an accounting business. So they, they want to know that you have knowledge or expertise. Uh, have you shown profits in the past? And this doesn't mean like the recent past. If 20 years ago you were an artist and you had livelihood at that, and, and then you stopped doing that as a business, and now you're starting again and you have losses, you know, if you did it in the past, you, you have an argument that you can do it again. And then if you had profits in recent years, you know, the last few years, if you've had profits, uh, then you can make an argument that your loss should be allowed this year. And I will tell you, uh, generally the thinking is if you have profits three of the prior five years, then you're considered to be a business. That is not an IRS hard and fast rule. Uh, and then you, can you really demonstrate that you expect to make a profit in the future? I want to jump quickly now into a tax court case decided in 2014, has a lot of implications for uh, those of you who are right now uh, in, the, in the business of creating art and selling it. Um, Susan Crow was, a, was a, a woman who uh, was an artist by trade, uh, taught a few classes at Hunter College in New York City. Uh, and then they liked that. She's a studio art instructor. They liked that. And so they said, why don't you be a professor for us? And through the long winding road, she achieved tenured status uh, at Hunter College. Um, she also uh, spent her summers uh, in upstate New York painting. Uh, and so she created a lot of art. She put this art in galleries uh, and she did have some pieces that were sold. Uh, prior to getting to academia, she was an artist, so she had a livelihood at that. Um, she did a great job of documenting her research and um, uh, in, in all of her art projects. And, uh, and, and then she did a lot of things that were unpleasant. All of these I'm telling you because these are arguments you make when you are not in a hobby. And so these were uh, arguments she made with the IRS. Uh, and then she changed galleries, trying to improve sales. That was some behavior that she changed uh, to try and improve her prof profitability. Okay, so what was the tax court ruling? And by the way, I, I thoroughly enjoyed reading this case. This was a hard case for tax, the judge to decide uh, because, uh, and you'll see why in a moment. Uh, hey, all right, you go girl. Uh, she won. Uh, they, she got, uh, even though she had a lot of losses, uh, she was able to say that, yes, I was still a business. And remember, she was offsetting her professorship salary 
with these losses. Uh, now, when I'm reading this tax case, I'm saying, why did they go to tax court? That was nuts. Um, she really kind of qualifies. And, and here's why. I want you to notice, um, and, and you'll notice there's a gap in a year here. I bet she had profits that year and pay taxes. And so they didn't argue with those. Um, but she had gross receipts. This is sales. And then one year, no sales. And yet she had all of these expenses. And, and she was deducting this from her salary, which was anywhere from 67,000 to I think a little over 100,000. And she had some other investment income and stuff that these were netting against. So, wow, uh, you, the IRS is looking at this. And remember, I, remember I start with it's theirs, right? That's their mentality, it's theirs. So what they argued in tax court was that none of these deductions were allowed beyond these amounts because it was a hobby. Um, and, and, but the tax court said, no, it was not a hobby. Uh, now, let me tell you one thing that the tax court did say, uh, because IRS never said they were not ordinary, they were not necessary, nor were they unreasonable. They did not make that argument because if they had, they would have been admitting that she was in a business because those are arguments you make for business deductions. So they simply said she was in a, in a hobby. Now the court said, hey, it's not a hobby. She's in trade or business, um, but we're not gonna say anything as to whether the deductions were ordinary, necessary, uh, or reasonable. Um, now I will tell you, I, I would love to know what happened to, in the follow-up there negotiation uh, but generally speaking, you can win most of those arguments unless you really are doing something in left field. Uh, I want to mention a, a few things. I mean, she had she had three thousand dollars a year in entertainment expenses. You know, she went to Italy and had ten thousand dollars of travel expenses. She had the uh, interest expense and property tax on her upstate New York studio that she was deducting. I mean, this was. You could see why the IRS was not happy with her return. Um, now, why did she win? Because she documented, and this is for you who are in business right now. When you, when you meet with Christian Anderson at LVA, document it. Met with, not a lot, just a little. Met with it, Christian on this day. We talked about how I might be able to sell more art product. Uh, you know, every meeting you have, all of the activities you do, the research you do, just make a note. I did this on this day, keep a daily journal, whatever it is, doesn't have to be extensive, but what the IRS is ultimately gonna be looking for, are you acting like you're in business? Now we're gonna to jump to entity choice. I'm off by a few minutes, but I think we can get there and allow for questions. I see uh, there are some comments in chat. I don't see what they are. So uh, uh, hopefully they're good questions for us. I mentioned early on, I'm, I'm not uh, predisposed to tell you that you should create a limited liability company uh, for your uh, activity if you're a Schedule C taxpayer. Uh, and there are reasons for that. Uh, the first thing I want, to, it's costly. There's a lot of hidden costs. So, you know, you're at a function or you're at wherever you are, the people that wherever you're meeting with, and there's always somebody in there, oh, you should do this. Oh, you should, you should incorporate yourself. You can expense a lot more things. Well, that's not true. Uh, there are a few differences, some to the positive, uh, like retirement that you can do if you're self-employed, that you can't do if you create an entity, or maybe you can, depends. And, and health insurance premiums are treated a little bit differently. But otherwise, every expense that you can do legitimately in a corporation, you can do in a Schedule C. And every expense you illegitimately take in a corporation, like they, oh, you can expense a lot of things. Well, if, you, if you're not supposed to, yes, you can. Well, you can also expense those in Schedule C when you're not supposed to. So really, there's only one reason in my mind to, and that's to avoid self-employment tax. And I'm gonna talk about that. Remember, that's that 15.3% uh, tax that you pay on your net profits. And if you don't have a lot of net profits, I mean, why bother? But let's say you do. Let's say you have $100,000 bottom line profit from your creative 
activity. And what you wanna do is you do wanna probably create a limited liability company and you wanna be taxed as an S Corp. I don't have enough time to talk about all the differences. I will answer your questions if you email them to me uh, specific, but you'll be taxed as an S Corp. Now you have to be an employee of the corporation and you have to pay yourself a salary. And remember, you're paying 7.65% as an employee and the employer, which is the company you own, is also paying 7.65%. So on the 50,000, of your salary, you're still paying the 15.3% tax, but you are avoiding it on the remaining 50,000. Uh, and so at that level, and if you're gonna sustain profits like that for years to come, yes, it does make sense. But if, it, but if you're smaller than that, you don't have that kind of income, uh, then I just don't, I just don't recommend it. A lawyer will tell you differently, I'm not a lawyer, uh, I can also tell you, though, I don't believe you're shielded from liability personally if you're actively engaged in it. But again, I'm not a lawyer. And so, uh, oh, and this is a good time for the disclaimer. I don't practice law. LVA doesn't practice law. And none of this is tax advice. You need to talk to your tax advisor. Uh, there we go. So now uh, I'm going to stop my rapid talking and open it up for uh for questions. And here's my email again. Uh, so I'm happy to respond to, uh, to any questions. Okay, Glenn, um, I'm going to start, but I'm going to do these in the order in which they have come in. So first we had uh, the question, do you have to have a tax number, tax ID number to sell art? Well, that's a great question. The answer is no. If you are, uh, uh, it's no in two ways. If you are doing Schedule C, meaning you want to put your sales on that form, and then you want to have some deductions to lessen the impact of that on that form, you can use your Social Security number, because remember, it is your, uh, it is your personal tax return. Um, and then if you're going to treat it instead as a hobby, uh, you don't even need a tax ID, you simply put it on a line item on your uh, on the front page of your tax return uh, and as other income and you put the net amount. Okay, and there's two questions here. I'm going to read them both because it seems to me like they feed into one another and you're, you, I think your answers could right. overlap. So uh, I'm gonna say first, how much taxable income do I need to file taxes if I'm just starting and the income is very low? And then the related question, do you recommend newly established artists have tax professionals prepared? Their, uh, have taxes professionally prepared at least for the first few years or is it possible to do your own taxes? Okay, so I'm gonna answer the last question first. It is possible for, for you to do your own taxes. They're really not that complicated. If you use TurboTax, uh, there's probably a Schedule C. I don't know for certain, but there are tax software out there where if you have Schedule C, uh, you can do it yourself. Uh, you just keep good records. Um, in terms of is there a minimum? Yeah, well, there's, there's not a minimum for owing tax, but if you receive any income, you should file a tax return uh, on it. And so um, it, um, uh, and it should be, uh, it should be Schedule C or it should be the other income line uh, on your regular tax return. Well, let me let me pose this follow-up question to it. What is a what is an example of a circumstance where somebody who has been doing their own taxes should start to look at having them professionally prepared? What shifts for them? Uh, and, and that's a good question. I, you know, what shifts is is they're starting to make money. Mm -hmm. which means that they're, they're going to make sure that they're not missing any deductions and that they want to look at retirement planning options. So I will give you an example. Uh, if you're self-employed Schedule C or you're in partnership with somebody where you have self-employment income in both those instances, uh, retirement plans available to you are fantastic and way better than you can do as an employee uh, 
where you're limited to what you can do and then you can't do an IRA if you're doing a 401k contribution. It, it, I mean, it's you can get up to $56,000 in deductions that you put into your retirement. Now you have to have the income, but so, so it's really the question is when you start to have a greater income and your tax liability moves from lower, uh, you know, tax rates are graduated. So if you make a little bit of money, you pay 10%. Make a little bit more, you pay 12% of the extra, you make some more, you get into 22%, 24, and all the way up to 37. Uh, and then there's some other taxes. And uh, But uh, when you start getting a big tax liability, it's cost effective to hire a CPA uh, to make sure that you are uh, not missing anything. Okay. Uh, then uh, here's a question about contract work. If you are doing something like contract work, for example, making murals, and being paid by different organizations, would all the stuff for the sole proprietor rules apply? Yes, and 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 each of those organizations are, if they're paying you more than six hundred dollars in a twelve month period, they are supposed to notify the IRS that they what they paid you, and so you're supposed to report all of those receipts on your personal tax return under Schedule C. Okay. And uh, uh, how do grants fall into the equation? Is it considered income, even though your deductions far outweigh the grant amount? Okay, remember remember the first slide, it's theirs, everything. <laughs> and there's a section in the IRS code, section 61, I think it's called, literally everything you receive is income. Now I am. I will make a. I will make a slight deviation here. Remember, they all, there are all kinds of exceptions. But uh, graduate students who receive fellowships uh, for doing work sometimes those are not treated as income. But that's really not business income. Our topic is on business income. But if you if you receive money, uh, it's income. Now if you if you have deductions that are used in the production of that income part of that income and they're, you know, they're legitimate, they're ordinary, necessary and reasonable, then you get to offset the grant amount. And if there's a net amount, you will owe tax on that. And if there's not, you won't. Now, there is a question, if you have a loss, uh, I think the IRS is gonna take a position that if it was a grant, you weren't really in business. Business doesn't get grants, nonprofits get grants. And so, uh, so you don't, you don't get the benefit of a loss. Uh, and there's there's one other question, and I uh, I mean you you talked about this uh, in various ways, but maybe to give kind of a sort of a thumbnail capture of this again. So how does the IRS determine if it's a hobby or if it's business? Well, so let me give you an example in that tax court case where uh, Susan Crow met. Some of those, there were a couple they said she did not meet the requirement. Those were the nine things that I mentioned in the, in the slide. Are you business like? Did you devote time to it? Did you try and change things to improve the profitability? Are you an expert in that field? All those, those are the those are what they do to decide. The tax court said that while she didn't do all of them perfectly, she did enough of them in the preponderance of her activity was sufficient for the judge to say, you know, this hobbyists don't do this. People that are in business do this. That's a good, good way for you to ask yourself, if I'm a hobbyist, would I be doing this? Well, and if the answer is no, then document it. Document it, because you may need that later if the IRS comes a knocking. Well, hey, let, me, okay. let me mention one more thing quickly uh, as it relates to spouse. I took this slide out, and but... If, if your spouse earns income and you have this kind of uh, activity and you have a loss and you're offsetting your spouse income, the diff meter starts spinning rapidly. The other flip side of that is if, you, if, if your spouse has a lot of income, W-2, and you're engaged in this activity and you show a profit, which is great, all right, now you're making money, you don't get the small tax rate on your profit your profit gets added to the other income, which may already be in a higher tax rate. And so it, it's hard to be in business. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, and I, and I think the Susan Kreil example, uh, you know, her being somebody who had a, a career in education, but the, the work as an artist is still a viable business. It's just like anybody who might be doing two jobs or running two businesses or anything. Well, and, and Keith, you bring up a good point. I'll, I'll make a final point on her. And I did not mention this. The other argument that the IRS made was that, and, and so if, if, if it's not a hobby, then it's, then it's not really a business because those are expenses she needed to pay to keep her employment. Mm -hmm. So they were unreimbursed employment expenses that are treated very differently and way more favorable for the IRS. And so that was the other argument uh, they were making, but the, the court was clear on that. Even though they were similar in business, they were distinct and, 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 and her employment did not require her to do that. Okay. We just had another question come in. Uh, I think it's a good one. You mentioned doing research. How do you file that? How do you document research? Is it as, as hours or how do you go about doing that? Um, I would do it. Uh, it, it I, hours is probably not bad. Um, I would, you know, but you could do blocks of time. Uh, you're not, you know, you don't have the clock meter going like uh, CPAs often do. Um, just, you know, we spent two hours this week on research. I, I would even argue that if you, Every Friday, you sat down in a journal and wrote what you did for that week, and and you and you can honestly raise your hand under oath and say that uh, that I did this each Friday. I didn't do it fifty two times when you came a calling in one night. Um, that would be good. That's good documentation. But I sort of I, I want to clarify this because I, Melissa, I'm I'm going to take a stab at, at maybe reading into your question here. But you cannot you cannot deduct your own time for research. Oh. Like you cannot put your own hourly value on something. So let's say you're doing fifty hours for research for something. You cannot say that my time is worth twenty dollars an hour times fifty. So therefore, I can deduct X, Y, and Z. Correct. That is just the loss of absolutely what it correct. Is. Okay. Absolutely correct. It's, it's the same argument you can't make on the uh, non cash charitable deduction. You just your your labor is worthless to the IRS unless somebody pays for it. <laughs> then you have um, to record it as income, but they get a tax deduction. Sure. Uh, I know we're getting close to, to, to seven here. I mean, if there's any last questions, throw them in the chat. Um, this has been recorded. We'll put it up on our website for y'all to go back and reference. Um, Glenn, uh, are you willing to make this slideshow of it? I guess I'm throwing you on the spot here. Are you willing to make this slideshow available as, as some notes for people if people want to? Uh, sure, absolutely. I can convert it into a PDF deck and email it to anybody. Right. And, you know, um, or info it, however y'all do. <laughs> Info at louisvillevisualart.org. If you want to deal with Glenn directly, it's Glenn at louisvillevisualart.org. If you want to deal with me, Christian at Louisville Visual Art, Keith, Keith at Louisville Visual Art, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, I mean, any, any last questions to the group, feel free to throw them in the chat. Otherwise, uh, again, I want to thank Glenn for spending this time uh, talking about it. And I sort of want to reiterate that uh, we'll do a whole separate session just particularly on bookkeeping and so how you can keep track of all of this stuff to then lead you into into taxes. Um, so the two are kind of linked, but they are definitely two sessions worth. Um, you know, I want to thank again Brooke Smith for for underwriting this series and next month is going to all you know be with Esther Callahan. Uh, critic in residence with the Great Meadows Foundation. So really talking about how to sort of conduct uh, an efficient studio visit with whether it's a, a critic or a curator or a gallerist or, or all this to get the most out of it. Uh, thanks as ever to Keith the Oracle for, for all things uh, LVA. Um, well, like I said, it's... Hmm? Go ahead, Keith. And I just wanted to clarify, uh, to, I wanted to, one thing I wanted to do was just give a plug that... Uh, we have a radio show that I host and tomorrow morning will it's an interview with Esther Callahan, mm -hmm. uh, who is just the most fun person in the whole world to talk to about art and stuff. Uh, but also the, uh, we'll, we'll post this on our YouTube channel, which is filled with all sorts of other fascinating interviews and programs. If you haven't ever looked at the YouTube channel for little visual art. Yep. So, so thank you all. Uh, thank you so much. Um, 
So, all right. Well, uh, good night, everyone. And hopefully we'll see you next month. Take our follow-up survey and I will send the link and information out for the next session as soon as I can. Um, so wishing you all a Statler and a Statler, Waldorf and Waldorf. I don't know who the three of us are, but uh, on behalf of LVA, good night. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>